uh, focused in terms of um, access determination and then the uh, right to conscientious objection and how that um, really is in the constitution and how it's operationalized. And then about the study which we're doing, which is looking at how the right to conscientious objection in this context is or isn't being vindicated, managed, uh, reported, et cetera, and how, how uh, we want to see that evolve. So that's, that's where we are. Have we got a stuck? Uh, sorry. Okay, just uh, very briefly then to say a little about demographics. Um, so just just to say here is colors aren't great, but this just tells you a little about the changing religious um complexion if you like of the irish state over the years this goes from the census of 1881 to the census of 2016 and you can see that the this dark blue is the uh, really, uh roman catholic uh, belonging and you can see those from you know almost 1981 to a high point of almost 96% of uh, uh, um, religious affiliation being Catholic in 1961, and that was the high point, and then uh, significantly dropping in, in recent decades until we now have a position where 78% of the population declares themselves in the census as belonging to the Roman Catholic Church. But as Owen said yesterday, um, uh um the oh no we don't want to, yeah oh yeah okay as owen said yesterday the the this uh levels of participation are significantly less than uh, significantly less than um the uh, formal belonging the other thing that you'll see here is Um, there's significant diversity other um, so the, 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 the other 20 something percent um, in addition to um, Roman Catholic uh, um, affiliation declining the other significant decline is in Church of Ireland which is Anglican that that population is declining significantly as well um, the <clears throat> proportion of the population that is growing um, most uh, quickly is the no religion, declared no religion, and um, particularly amongst, um, you know, under 35s, that they represent a much larger, the no religion represent a much larger proportion of um, the under uh, 35s than, than any others. And just referencing to uh, Jeremy's discussion uh, yesterday, the Orthodox Church in Ireland is, well, is, is the fastest growing obviously from a very low base, but is the fasting fastest growing um, uh, uh, religious community in Ireland. So that's just to say something about demographics. But here, um, it just tells you a little more about the politics of religion. This uh, slide on this side tells you about the enrollments of children in um, publicly funded schools in um, 2021. And you can see that although there's a decline in um, the number of people with religious affiliation, uh, Roman Catholic religious affiliation, nonetheless, 89.2% of children enrolled in school in um, 2021 were, so 90% in Catholic controlled, you know, trust controlled primary schools, uh, 7.6 uh, in multi-denominational, almost three in, um, in Ireland, and this other 0.3%, which is, um, you know, with uh, explicitly secular, um, uh, 
um, governance or the small number of um, uh, other religious traditions who are providing primary schools. So, so there's still a very significant institutional presence of uh, religion in primary schools. Catholic um, secondary school or high school is slightly different, but, uh, but um, with a, a, a smaller proportion. So that's about the politics of religion, the context of education. And then in relation to health, which is obviously uh, the, the relevant one for our discussion today, uh, similarly in, in, um, in Ireland, we've got a large um, um, uh, uh, public health system and also a large voluntary sector, which is, but, which is publicly funded. Um, but and of the acute hospitals, that's sort of the full spectrum hospitals, 30% of these in the state are still have a formal religious governance, almost all of them uh, Roman Catholic. In, and, and also uh, most of the maternity hospitals, standalone maternity hospitals in the uh, country also have a formal religious governance oversight. Again, uh, in this case, all Catholic. Um, and, but even those that are publicly, uh, formal pu um, public hospitals as opposed to voluntary, meaning with some um, um, NGO type uh, or private um, uh, ownership, even those that are public have a lot of religious, formal religious um, involvement in terms of the, um, in terms of the governance, for example, the national uh, the National Maternity Hospital, which is the largest public um, maternity hospital, which uh, those of you who are following some of the politics is uh, is moving to a religiously owned um, site, so grounds. Um, but even as it stands, the major national maternity hospital, although it's a publicly public hospital, has as its chair of the board, the Archbishop of Dublin, Catholic Archbishop of Dublin. Now, actually, to, to be fair to him, uh, when there was a lot of debate about this a couple of years ago, he stood down as the chair. Um, but nonetheless, it's still there in the governance. So, so we do still have quite a lot of um, infrastructural presence of um, formal um, religious presence in health and education. Um, the, um, just, uh, the changes of, in religious affiliation um, uh, really um, be uh, became much more obvious, I suppose, once from the 1990s onwards. But if you remember in that first slide, you see that 1961 is sort of the high point of Catholic, um, uh, formal uh, Catholic affiliation in, in Ireland. And through the 1960s, 70s and 80s, there was, I suppose, a significant level of um, Catholic activism, specifically around the issue of reproduction. Um, the, in the um, Irish state, it, um, the Irish state really adopted a great deal of the um, pre-independence uh, legislation. And so abortion was illegal in Ireland under the Offence Against the Person Act uh, 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 with an 1861 Act, which is the same act that governed um, the UK legislation. Uh, but through the 1970s, there was a great deal of anxiety about, um, first of all, Roe v. Wade in the US that um, uh, really, I suppose, established uh, a woman's right to access termination on the grounds of the right to privacy. And in, on the, in the same year, in 1973, uh, in Ireland, there was a, a Supreme Court case, um, State v. McGee, which established the right of married couples to access contraception on the same basis of the right to privacy. Uh, and um, uh, so there was a great deal of anxiety that something similar to Roe v. Wade would be able to be established in Ireland. So 
um, a, a significant number of religiously uh, um, motivated and, and, and broadly, um, more, uh, but mainly religiously motivated activists began a campaign to insert into the Irish constitution a right, um, the right to life of the unborn so that something like um, the right to privacy could never trump uh, the, uh, or undermine the um, legislative basis of the, um, uh, of the um, prohibition of abortion in, in, in legislation. And so following a very um, acrimonious campaign in 1983, the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution to Article 43.3, was inserted and that uh, text uh, which was put in the constitution says the state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practicable uh, by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. Um, it was, um, as I say, extremely um, contentious. The, a lot of the debate was really about, is this necessary? Um, what, will, uh, what does the equal right to life of the uh, mother mean? Um, what, what is this terminology of the unborn? Um, and, but, uh, you know, I suppose there was a great deal of um, um, social, um, pressure on people um, uh, through the campaign. The, 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 the Christian churches, um, the Catholic Church uh, and some of the Church of Ireland bishops supported the in insertion of the uh, amendment into the constitution, uh, though um, all, all of the churches said um, it is possible to vote against the, the insertion of this in conscience, uh, but, you know, nonetheless, the, the, the strong advice and all of the campaigning was um, to insert this in order to protect the unborn. Just uh, as an aside, it is important to say that um, uh, this um, right to life of the unborn was something that became you know, more and more politicized in Roman Catholicism in particular through the 20th century, um, using the language from the moment of conception. That language you find in a lot of pro-life um, literature at the moment, you find it in a lot of Catholic, um, Roman Catholic um, uh, theology, but this terminology of from the moment of conception is a relatively new invention, you could say invention, in, even in Roman Catholicism, it only begins to appear in the 20th century. And up until um, the 1869, um, there was a strong formal distinction between what the, the Catholic Church called the animated and unanimated fetus. That is, you know, there was a belief that up until 40 days, the fetus didn't have a soul. And so there was really, although due regard was to be taken for the protection of this potential life, there really wasn't this um, sort of overwhelming um, um, interpretation of um, uh, fetal life needing to be protected from the moment of conception. And again, it sort of reminds me a little of the, Jeremy's start of, of his lecture yesterday, talking about the way in which um, various interpretations of sacred texts or um, sort of seminal um, uh, um, texts get interpreted and reinterpreted over time. So, so one, would, one would think now, particularly, I think, um, in a lot of Roman Catholic literature that this moment of conception is a very fundamental um, sort of principle, uh, establishes a very uh, fun fundamental principle, protection of life from the moment of conception, but that is a, a, a relatively new um, development. But in any case, um, the um, Eighth Amendment to the Constitution was inserted into the Constitution 
it was it uh, had a voter turnout of 54 percent which is relatively high for referenda in ireland i mean it's not but it's it's on the 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 upper end of participation and was passed with 67 percent of the vote um the um So oh, you would think, well, okay, it's done. <laughs> but of course it wasn't done. <clears throat> and um, the, I suppose the first thing to say, the reason, part of the reason why it wasn't done was that um, the, the, the referendum campaigns were so acrimonious that I think, um, and of course, uh, you know, government parties, I think, were some of them were really um, overwhelmed by the level of acrimony um, and um, you know the, the government party that actually introduced the amendment was itself a reluctant um, uh, in terms of introducing this at all but was really under a lot of pressure to do so so um, the government once this was um, enacted really you would say sought to ignore it not to give legislative effect to um, you know what this meant in practice in terms of equal due regard to the equal rights. So um, there was <clears throat> a, certainly a desire to ignore this and to say, well, the pro-life campaign got what they wanted. It's in the constitution. Let's move on. Um, <clears throat> but uh, nobody really was able to move on. In the first instance, I suppose, the uh, those who really campaigned to insert this uh, clause into the constitution wanted to ensure that there would be the most um, uh, you might say absolutist interpretation of this and so um, they also sought then to have various restrict um, uh, further amendments um, added that would um, direct the way in which the um, any legislation would be uh, developed. Um, we had a number of, um, immediately a number of cases, first and most famously being the X case, which was um, the, a, a case where a, uh, a young, um, I think she was 13 or 14 year old girl had been raped and her parents wanted uh, and became pregnant as a result of that rape and her parents wanted to take her to the UK for termination and um, uh, there was a judicial review and she was stopped and uh, that actually um, uh, and then eventually she was permitted to, to travel but that generated a whole series of um, uh, attempts to clarify the, um, the the extent and the limit of the um, uh, of the amendment. So, in nineteen, uh, there was a, a decade of politicking, I suppose you say. And in nineteen ninety two, the twelfth amendment proposal sought to exclude the risk of suicide as sufficient reason to allow a legal to legally allow abortion. Now that was defeated by sixty five percent. So. Um, so um, going back to this, uh, to the article itself, so the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal life, to life of the mother. So um, uh, what is, um, uh, how do you vindicate that right, particularly if uh, a woman is suicidal? So that was um, those uh, who were sort of in, wanted a, a more absolutist interpretation, wanted to exclude the, the so the risk to, to, to life, want, they wanted to exclude the right, uh, that they, the risk of suicide, that was defeated by 65%. Uh, uh, there was also an, at the same time, actually 12th, 13th and 14th amendments of the con to the constitution um, were um, um, uh, part of the same um, uh, referendum. Uh, uh, the 13th amendment sought to establish that the prohibition of abortion would not limit the freedom to travel in and out of the state. So the argument there was that, um, uh, you know, just as uh, an Irish citizen is permitted to 
travel in and out of the Irish state to procure services legally available in any other country. Similarly, that should be the case for the termination of pregnancy. And that was passed by 62%. And then the 14th Amendment sought to provide the right to distribute information about abortion services in foreign countries, and that was passed by 60%. And I suppose you might even be asking why, why was that such an issue? Well, 1992 was sort of just the beginning of the internet. So actually, um, uh, there wasn't the kind of same level of access to information um, uh, just through a, you know, a Google search or whatever in 1992, really access to abort information about what was legally available, for example, in the UK or in Northern Europe, really was primarily through printed material. And so that's why that was a, a very uh, important um, uh, um, campaign. <clears throat> so those, so you can see there that through the, the amendments, these amendments, there was a sort of, you might say in the public's mind, a kind of a gradual sort of realization that uh, an absolutist interpretation of the Eighth Amendment would um, be highly restrictive on all sorts of grounds. So you can see this sort of gradual, um, you might say softening of the, of the, um, the approach. And then there was a further um, uh, um, uh, um, series of debates through the 1990s and the 25th Amendment uh, sought to remove the threat to suicide as a ground for legal abortion uh, again. So, you know, that was the one that, the, that a number of campaigners were not letting go of um, and that that was rejected actually. Um, uh, that sought to overturn the 1992 12th Amendment, but it was only, um, only um, barely uh, rejected. Um, uh, so uh, it, it, the, the politics uh, was that, you know, the 1983 amendment was not, was just the beginning of it, that the politics of, of um, access and repeal rather than, rather than the end of it. Um, in parallel, just to say there were relevant other, so through 19, from the 1980s, 90s, and noughties, uh, in this, at the same time as this sort of, um, you might say, pro-life juggernaut was attempting to shape uh, the politics of reproduction, you had other really relevant changes that were changing the shape of, of Irish society. Um, there was accelerating decline in religious practice and observance. So even though the um, um, affiliation was declining slowly, um, practice and observance was declining, you know, very rapidly. We see, um, uh, you know, um, uh, participation in Sunday service, for example, in, in Roman Catholic Church, in, in some counties around the country is as low as, you know, between 20 and 30 percent. And that was so that the, the define that servants, uh, the discovery of the extensive sexual abuse and cover up in the Catholic Church, all of that was happening in these decades as well. And that was just I think um, uh, in the context of the issues of um, um, reproductive rights, I think the issue there was really um, about the hypocrisy, the perceived hypocrisy, you know, rather than um, anything else. Um, the collusion of church and state in policing the pun and punishing the alleged sexual misconduct of women through the infrastructure of mother and baby homes, Magdalene laundries, et cetera, that was all exposed as well in, with you know, women uh, who had grown up in these homes, um, uh, beginning to speak about their experiences, um, families beginning to acknowledge that they had been part of a society that had um, shut away women who were um, uh, you know, pregnant outside of marriage, um, children or ad adult uh, men and women finding their mothers usually over 
years of you know having um, uh, not known um, that they were adopted or and, and all of those issues began to be exposed and again I think here although a great deal of focus was on the church's role I think the 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 state's um, standing back from its responsibilities to, to, um, uh, to uh, and just allowing another institution to, um, to manage all of this. That is one of the things I think that has also been, um, you know, very important in terms of a realization that church and state colluded, but actually it was the derogation of the responsibilities of the state that are partly, um, you know, responsible here, and I think that's also why, um, when we look at how the issues about, um, you know, religious uh, control and oversight of hospitals and education, that's part of it. It's this is this is the state's responsibility. Many people would feel, and that it cannot be outsourcing. Um, uh, health, education, and social care to, um, uh, to other organizations. That, that certainly was one of the sort of um, orientations that one found uh, in a great deal of the, um, uh, of the, the analysis and narratives um, in that period. So that by um, 2001, um, there were, you know, you began to see that any um, you know market research on uh, issues about um, uh, sexuality, you began to see already a, a change in attitudes. So that uh, in the two thousand and one Lans Lansdowne market research, um, uh, fifty two percent uh, said they believed access to abortion should be available in limited circumstances in Ireland. Um, just as a, an aside here, and I'll move on very quickly. Um, uh, I remember being part of uh, uh, the, the development of a um, behavior and attitude survey in, I think it was about 2003, maybe, um, when um, it, there was going to be the first extensive um, national survey of sexual attitudes, beliefs, and values. and um, uh, it's been done by um, absolutely stellar researcher um, Hannah McGee. But as we were developing the, the parameters, we decided I was just involved as a as a board member on the, uh, and we decided that we would ask a series of questions about abortion, about people's attitudes, beliefs, uh, you know, a, a range of, of questions. So. The, um, the, the survey was launched, it was a national survey, it you know, was running over a couple of eight weeks or whatever. And um, then the analysis was being done. And um, the minister, suddenly the government discovered that there was going, that, that there was this national survey that was asking people about their attitudes to abortion. And I remember um, myself and another colleague being hauled into the sort of principal secretary of the Department of Health's uh, office to be told we should not have asked that those questions. The government didn't want to know what the uh, what the uh, what the public thought. This was a settled matter, and also um, we were requested, directed not to publish the responses to these questions. So, like, pretend you didn't ask them. But anyway, of course we. Um, uh, didn't um, agree to that, and we published the, the 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 report, the savvy report, and you can and you can see there that there was a very significant change in attitude, a, a, a more nuanced approach by you know uh, by two thousand by the early two thousands, but um, so. So I think I am just being very um, sort of giving a fairly superficial account of what was happening in these decades. But you can see that what 
all the time while the legislative while, while the constitutional issues were being debated and efforts to kind of formally restrict even more um, clear uh, even formally restrict uh, any interpretations that might open uh, some access there was um, uh, at the same time, society, society was changing very radically in terms of its perceptions and views. The, the uh, final um, uh, point that I want to, to, to talk about just before I talk about the actual, um, the, the, the repeal of the amendment, is also to say that in addition to um, the uh, legislative uh, and um, uh, uh, constitutional issues being debated in the Irish context, there were also a number of very important um, uh, uh, cases that went to the European Court of Human Rights uh, that were brought by Irish citizens, uh, essentially uh, on the grounds that even within the limited access uh, to legal termination that was in Ireland, as in if a woman's right uh, life is at risk, there was still no legislation and no legislative provision or and, and no um, professional codes uh, that would give any direction to medics about when and if this was possible and permissible. And so, um, we had three cases in, in the European Court of Human Rights um, in 2010, A, B, and C, um, which sought um, to, well, they, they were on different grounds, but um, essentially it was to force the Irish state to legislate for those uh, cases where uh, abortion there was a legal right to abortion within the uh, Irish uh, state. And also, secondly, um, there were tests to kind of broaden that um, interpretation. So um, the European uh, Court of Human Rights didn't find that Ireland's uh, abortion laws violated the European Convention of Human Rights. As we know that that's, uh, you know, uh, that that's the way in which the European Court uh, of human rights interprets these uh, issues, um, uh, but it did hold that Ireland had failed to adopt legislation and establish an effective and accessible procedure for women to access law lawful abortion. So, um, and that this failure amounted to a violation of Ireland's positive obligations under Article 8 of the European um, uh, Convention, that is the right to respect uh, for private life. And the European Court ordered Ireland to establish a legislative framework to implement abortion law. So you can see that from 1983, successive governments of all persuasion, um, uh, whether they were, uh, whether, um, whether individuals supported access to abortion or not, governments refused to, to, to legislate. Uh, for for access, even in those cases where um, uh, abortion was legal. So through for a number of years, there was a bit of you know politicking about how would this happen. I think the state, uh, the government of the day, thought, well, we'll just ignore it again. But you know there there was a momentum growing, and for, in nine, in two thousand and eleven, the government uh, of the day did. Uh, say that it would establish a, um, a process whereby this issue would be um, would be um, uh, legislated for. But in the interim, in 2012, and um, people will probably um, know uh, this case very well, um, they, that was really overtaken by the death of Savita Halapanavar in Galway University Hospital in 2012, uh, and that you know made international headlines. Um, she was refused termination during a miscarriage because the obstetrician was still able to detect a fetal heartbeat, and the obstetrician woman uh, was um, anxious that if she um, uh, um, 
did the procedure while there was still a fetal heartbeat, she could be prosecuted for um, for for um, uh, uh, providing an unlawful abortion. And it must be said that the medical council and the professional associations in that period had still no guidance at all. It was uh, it was. Uh, uh, and so the report into her death found that there was an overemphasis on the need not to intervene until the fetal heart rate had stopped. And the report found that this was a direct consequence of a strict interpretation of the requirements of Article 433. Um, uh, it, it wasn't the only cause but it was the primary cause, it said, together with an underemphasis on managing the risk of infection. And so there was sort of this medical account. So, um, so there was but at that stage a determination to um, really address this issue of the equal rights to life. Uh, um, and um, in through um, a, a phase in the when, when the program for government was being agreed amongst uh, the various coalition parties in 2016, uh, the program for government included a commitment to address this issue, but it was still very, um, very much a uh, without any clarity about how it would be addressed. And going back to Owen's um, uh, lecture yesterday. The government decided that in the first instance it would convene a citizens assembly to decide what that to get a sense of what the public's views were and uh, i would say that many of us who um uh, were involved in this um process for over many years thought that this was the government you know trying again to not take responsibility for um, you know, uh, it's uh, for, for the legislative process, but really to kick it down the road again. And I think, but one of the things that was so interesting about the Citizens Assembly was that it um, disclosed a, a far greater, far more liberal attitude to uh, termination than anybody could have predicted, actually. Um, in fact, the, the, the final report of the Citizens Assembly didn't really see any grounds for, um, this is a slight over exaggeration, but very limited grounds for limiting access um, up to the stage of fetal viability, so on, on any ground. So it was a very, very um, uh, um, liberal uh, view. But in any case, that went through various um, consultation phases with um, um, uh, the various um, Doyle committees. And uh, finally, in 2018, we had the proposal to delete um, article, uh, um, de delete the Eighth Amendment from the Constitution. And of course, um, that was uh, also quite a, um, a, a political, uh, involved a lot of politics because some people wanted a simple deleting, deletion, others wanted an insertion of something, you know, that gave access, um, greater access, but also constrained um, uh, the, the um, access in the constitution rather than in legislation. So, uh, but in the, in the event, the government decided that the, um, the proposal that would be put to the Irish people was a simple question. Do you agree to the removal of article 43.3, which is the equal right to life and replacing it with, a line, with the line, provision may be made by law for the regulation of termination of pregnancy. In parallel, the government published the legislation that they would enact or propose to enact if this was um, uh, if this was uh, passed, which, which was actually, I think, a, a very good political move because uh, people could see exactly what was likely to be the 
regime of access if this was uh, if this um, uh, article was removed and it included termination for any reason up to 12 weeks for any um, person over the age of 16 uh, and over the age of 15 in exceptional circumstances. And 15, 16, uh, it doesn't require parental consent, but it requires, you know, there are waiting periods and the involvement of a, um, uh, of a, uh, uh, um, an adult, you know, for um, advice and support. After 12 weeks, termination is possible only in cir exceptional circumstances. And these are where continuing pregnancy puts one's life at risk, risk serious harm to health, and is likely to lead to the death of the fetus either before or within 28 days of birth because of a problem with its development. So the fatal fetal abnormality. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that this is, um, the, these are issues that got a lot of um, airing in the uh, debate, even though it represents a very significant, uh, a very small percentage worldwide of the reasons why um, terminations take place, but in any case. Um, uh, so that was passed uh, with 64% turnout, which is much higher than uh, the 53%. The it's one of the highest turnouts that actually a, a referendum has had and passed by 67%, which is exactly the same percentage that the uh, amendment was inserted in the constitution 40 years earlier, or 30 years earlier. Um, briefly, I'm going to, to finish here very soon because I'm going on for too long. Um, the, there is another provision in the Irish constitution, of course, uh, article 44, uh, that states that freedom of conscience and the free profession of practice of religion are subject to public order and morality guaranteed to every citizen. So the right to freedom uh, of conscience and to uh, freedom of religion, uh, the, the belief and the manifest, but you know, one being um, absolute and the other being subject to the uh, public order and morality. And so this article is also replicated, or at least it frames the conscientious objection clause in the regulation of pregnancy, uh, termination of pregnancy act. Uh, and it, so it permits any person directly involved in the provision of services to opt out on the basis of his or her conscientious objection. It refers, uh, interestingly, it refers only explicitly to people directly involved in the provision of care. So, wives, obstetricians, anaesthetists. It does not, uh, and anybody in the theater that is, um, you know, in directly involved in, in, in the uh, termination, it does not include administrators in hospitals, it does not include, you know, even uh, nursing care on wards in preparation for termination or after termination, it doesn't include um, hospital porters, so it's very, very restricted in terms of who, who it, it, uh, it uh, refers to. It also, um, uh, and this has been very controversial, obliges conscientious objectors to provide for referral to a practitioner who will provide termination. Um, uh, and that particularly in the early stages of sort of um, pre non-surgical abortions is, is very um, controversial because in terms of general practitioners, uh, doctors, it requires them to, um, to refer. And that raises all sorts of complicity based objections, as you might imagine. Uh, uh, and even uh, more, it establishes a duty on the part of a, a conscientious objector to take part in a termination of pregnancy where there is an emergency situation, irrespective of conscientious objection. So there, there's the right, but it's very, it, it itself is very um, uh, limited and constrained. 
So where we are now is uh, that although we have a regime in which um, access to abortion up to 12 weeks without, um, you know, in, for, um, for personal, for, for whatever reason, is, is you know, quite um, fairly um, liberal in the context of even of Europe, actually. Um, nonetheless, only 10% of uh, general practitioners um, provide abortion services in Ireland, and only 7% of them are listed um, publicly on, you know, the, the act website where people can find um, the information about this. In uh, the northwest of Ireland, it's uh, it, there's it's, there are counties where there is no access. Uh, only 50% of the maternity hospitals provide abortion services. They dispute that, but that's the reality. Uh, there's a great deal of challenge in terms of access. Um, it's difficult for uh, also uh, those seeking termination for severe or fetal uh, fatal fetal abnormality. The numbers of women traveling to the UK for that purpose is grown rather than diminished despite that access. And that's because there has been litigation, um, at least threats of litigation, the early stages of litigation against um, practitioners um, uh, where they have provided um, uh, termination, or at least agreed to provide termination, and then um, uh, uh, the parents are saying, uh, well, then other medical practitioners saying, actually, this is not a fatal fetal abnormality. And so, you know, a lot, a lot of these test cases. Um, uh, so, uh, and also, uh, Going through the um, the Doyle or the you know, the, the House of Parliament at the moment is um, a, a a new act to try and establish a legal basis for safe ex uh, exclusion zones outside of maternity hospitals and GP surgeries um, because uh, there is as as in many countries a lot of um, you know um, intimidating behaviour um, and so although there there are um, restrictions at the moment, it is, um, they, they, they don't have any legislative basis. So that's the issues of access. So I suppose in the Irish context, the issues that are being majorly debated at the moment are how do we balance access uh, that is um, challenging with the rights to conscientious objection. And then in the context of conscientious objection, the ongoing issues are there is no formal process for re registering conscientious objection and very little or no, you would say, formal staff planning uh, for sort of uh, whether that's in terms of non-surgical and surgical, uh, in terms of ensuring access while recognizing that there will be a portion of the medical um, uh, community who have who want to exercise their right to conscientious objection. So again, I suppose just this sort of Irish solution to the Irish problem, stick your head in the sand, you know, enact the legislation and then don't make any provision for its operationalization. No formal process. Um, uh, so um, uh, we, we, have, we have no, um, it's all done at local level and there's there's no knowledge about how it's done. There's no discussion of the impacts of invoking conscientious objection on people's employment and future career prospects. Um, there's, um, there's, there are issues of the exclusions of certain people from the opportunity, you might say, to invoke conscientious objection exemption. So, um, you know, uh, the, the very limited number of people who can access, uh, and there are certainly a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of um, professionals who want to have access to this uh, exemption. And of course, the requirement to refer for, for termination um, 
is not covered by the right to content subjection. So there, there's a, there are these issues that are still being debated. Um, interestingly, the, um, this term, Termination of Pregnancy, uh, um, Pregnancy Act is the only piece of legislation enacted in the last sort of 30 years that requires a formal review of the legislation um, within a five year period. And that review is going on at the moment. And that was just a, uh, I think, a, a way of getting people who were um, yeah, politicians who were uncertain about this just to to actually um, support the legislation. So at the moment, the, the government is conducting a review um, and uh, a number of these issues are, are um, uh, being looked at. And of course, um, you know, there, there are people who are speaking very loudly about the need to ensure, ensure access. And there are people who are, uh, and so plan for access. And there are people who are, uh, shouting very loudly about you know, the need for protecting conscientious uh, objection and operationalizing that. So we have, um, uh, I'll just finish by saying we, um, with a number of um, colleagues from the law school, we have this newly funded study that is going to look over, to, uh, it's going to run for two years, it's going to look at how the right to conscientious objection is being operationalized in the Irish context. Um, the first thing we're doing at the moment, it's actually underway, is that we are doing a, um, really trying to do a case study of how conscientious objection is being um, applied in, in the Irish healthcare setting. So we are interviewing, I'm not, but you know, um, ethnographers are interviewing uh, managers, clinicians and other service providers about how the right to conscientious objection is being operationalized in different parts of the country, uh, in different um, kinds of settings, um, and also asking them what they think uh, should be considered when trying to balance these two sort of rights, the right to access uh, abortion services and the right to uh, conscientious objection. So what, from their sort of experiences on the ground in different settings, what are the things that would help harmonize these two? Uh, and then we're going to do a second phase, which is going to uh, look at um, how different jurisdictions um, The, the balancing of these rights and hopefully um, our intent is to um, you know, bring forward some principles that would you know um, look to the uh, near term and the longer term in terms of this is a particular phase first of all so one has to ensure that um, certainly in 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 the the medical and nursing literary context you might say that the, the grounds of operating have changed for a lot of practitioners, so one has to respect that, while uh, on the other hand, ensuring that over time, uh, you know, this issue of access and staff uh, and planning for access is, is, <clears throat> is, is taken seriously. So um, hopefully um, by the end of, uh, you know, the, the, well, within, I suppose, 10 months or so, we have you know, done all of the assessment of the interviews and see what the issues on the ground for various um, uh, practitioners are. So let me leave it there. Um, uh, and uh, just very happy to hear comments or questions about what has been um, a very um, you know, challenging time. Uh, just before I finish, I would want to say that um, I, I, I think, Tegan, you asked a question of Owen yesterday that I thought was very relevant, you know, um, in terms of um, uh, you know, what about this kind of liberal religious uh, view. If you look at the, you know, the percentage of people who uh, supported limited access to abortion 
in, in 2018, you can see that there was a very strong um, uh, a religious case made for support for uh, the, this uh, legislation. Uh, um, uh, 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 and so I do think that um, while we saw, a, while we do see in kind of the formal teaching of Roman Catholicism in particular, uh, kind of a hardening of the, the anti-abortion stand. On the other hand, there is a kind of a fair uh, degree of diversity within uh, the Roman Catholic Church in particular on this issue. And I think you found that reflected in the, um, the, the degree of support for this, um, uh, or for a limited access to, to abortion on the grounds of, you know, other, you know, different values within the, the Catholic tradition. So I think you saw that in the 67%, you know, there were lots of, and in fact, the Irish Council, I think it was for, um, I think that's what it's called, of um, Catholic clergy in Ireland came out with a very strong statement of support for repeal um, uh, uh, on the grounds that, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, al although they said, although we support the right to life of the unborn, there are um, contexts in which um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the um, in which, the, you know, they talked about shades of gray and it being about the conscientious decision of the woman. And also it ended its statement by saying something like, we're also very aware that as a group of unmarried male uh, clergy, we have, uh, you know, we need to be attentive to that in our public statements. And then they, the, the, the end of that statement said, we abhor the way in which uh, pulpits in the Catholic Church are being used to promote a very um, anti-female sort of uh, teaching. So it was quite an extraordinary um, statement, actually, and it, it got very little attention because it's like, well, you know, <laughs> at this stage, um, you know, the general public was, well, we don't really, you know, it doesn't matter to us what the National Council of Catholic Priests think, but on the other hand, I think it was a fairly significant statement um, of the way in which uh, uh, thinking has changed within religious uh, communities as well as in the broader society. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. I shouldn't be waiting for somebody else to pursue. No, 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 no. I, I'm happy to, to facilitate. So anybody, would people like to come up? Do you need to come up? Or for, it's for the online folks so that they can hear. I don't know if this is this picking up. It's not really picking up yet. So thank you very much for your presentation. And for fear of asking something I might have missed when I went to go blow my nose, because you moved then to the conscientious objection part of it, so missing it. But um, I was just then thinking about it. So South Africa, we've got pretty uh, good from a legislative perspective access to abortion. We've had it sort of since the beginning of our democracy uh, and similar uh, timeline in, up until the end of the first trimester, all of that, and completely unrestricted on the grounds. Um, and then I was thinking about it because I've heard a little bit, so now still in South Africa, we do have a thing, obviously, of doctors um, or gynecologists or the providers um, objecting. But then I was looking it up myself now in South Africa, the then uh, guideline that's been enforced by the government it's in our act. And then the guideline is if the provider has a conscientious objection, they can't be forced to do it but there is a requirement that they will at least provide the access to another provider who will. So sorry, did I miss that? Is that yes, the same so that, thing in that, Ireland yes, now? Yes, but then that was your point of the, the access then of other aspects geographically where they are placed and stuff. Well, yeah. So, so how to enforce it. Yeah, so it, that's right. So they, in principle- Is there a similar requirement yeah, even if they do? Okay. There is a similar requirement, okay. but then only 10 of physicians oh, have, um, uh, have um, 
disclose that they are prepared to okay. offer these services. And okay. so uh, there was a big debate uh, as the legislation was enacted as to uh, whether we would have an opt-in or an opt-out um, uh, system. So um, New Zealand has an opt-in system, which is uh, physicians have to say, I provide uh, a, a termination. This legislation assumes that everybody will, unless they opt out, they have to declare the contract of rejection. So that's the principle. However, then when you say, okay, so in principle, all sort of 4,000 um, GPs around the country um, uh, provide termination, how can I find out if, if my GP does, you go on the, the the website or you go to find out whether they say they are or not and only 10 percent tell tell the public whether they are or not and only seven percent make that publicly available through the national board so although there is a principle of you know the assumption that everybody does um uh, only 10% have uh, declared that they do or will. And in the Irish healthcare system, certainly the, the general practitioners in the community, um, they're not employed by the government. You know, they are um, business by the service and are paid either by the public, you know, by private citizens or by the government for the services they provide. So. So that's, that's why there is a, a big issue with access, because um, uh, although, the, um, although in principle uh, people have to opt out, they're not um, giving the information. So some people would say that actually it would have been better to have an opt-in because um, uh, then at least there'd be much more clarity. Um, but but at the moment, that's what I mean. I think in principle, it's better to have an opt out. But in practice, it's 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 creating a lot of um, uh, challenge. Well, um, I mean, maybe just to uh, stand back or give a wider view to, for example, this project that you're working on, as well as what you mentioned earlier in your talk about the educational system or sector, as well as the health yeah. sector. Uh, I mean, all these, uh, with this project and those two sectors, the, I mean, I can only give my own personal perception is that the discussions uh, as I see them, I mean, they're obviously focused on the particulars of that sector or the issues that people bring up, but the missing uh, framework always seems to be, there doesn't seem to be a discussion on the role of religion within society, you know, so, you know, all these issues at the end of the day really come down to what is the understanding or the decision of the role of that religion, you know, be it Roman Catholic or any other or, or you know, or no belief for that matter. Um, within, I guess, it's, I mean, are we a secular society? Uh, you know, it's 80% are, are Roman Catholics, so at least culturally. Yeah. I'm not sure how many go to, to church. Um, so um, my question, what is my question? Um, uh, so I, I guess I'm wondering why there's no discussion yeah. in the wider sense to be able to... to about these issues that would impact what you're doing mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. because um, you know, to have a conscientious objection, you know, they would, you know, I mean, I suspect it would be based on religious belief, 
but we don't know actually yeah. that's one yeah. of the things we really do want to know, whether the yeah. conscientious objection have, what, what are the grounds that people are using yeah. um uh, to, uh not using reasons, yeah. what, what's the motivating factor what language are they yeah. using we, we, so, uh, you know, until a few weeks ago, the discussion about the National Maternity Hospital, I mean, it's just, you couldn't escape it. Um, and, you know, it's very obvious that uh, they were litigating the specific issues about the hospital, but also the role of religion in society. Um, and it's just, could you say a few words about that or why that discussion doesn't seem to be taking place? Yeah. Um, it's a, I think it's a great question. A um, uh, couple of observations, I suppose. Um, uh, the, um, we heard yesterday um, from Owen Daly that there has been this, um, you might call it fairly self-congratulatory um, process in Ireland over the last 10 years of we are becoming more inclusive, liberal, pluralist, um, and we uh, and and this is being uh, you know reflected in the various referenda we've had on access to abortion, on marriage equality and other things. And um, uh, and this is now as much about our identity as it is about, um, you know, a specific, except in a couple of cases, specific issues of access or changes of, in, in terms of access. And I think he's right about this, um, you know, it's, uh, and what, um, what we seem to be giving effect to uh, is a sort of uh, uh, a desire amongst uh, a significant portion of the population to become more inclusive, pluralist, diverse, uh, you know, in terms of access to services, in terms of education, in terms of health, etc. But um, our infrastructure, whether it's health or education, health and education in particular, are still effective, significant, there's still a significant religious control. Um, and you know, in the case of the National Maternity Hospital, for example, you would expect that part of that agenda would be where there is an opportunity now to, without recrimination or without any, um, you know, particular comment about the past, uh, there's an opportunity now to establish a new national hospital fully funded by the state without any... Um, oversight of any particular religious community. And yet the default is actually, don't worry about it, but, but they are going to be, you know, they're going to have significant involvement. So I do think that in the national uh, maternity case, it, it, it's in the same way as Owen said, it's about symbolism as well as about rights. And uh, I think, um, in the Irish context, we haven't really had a discussion about the um, a lot of recrimination about particular individuals, about particular institutions in the past, but we've had no discussion about this was uh, practically universal acceptance of and reflection of this kind of version of Catholicism across the society. And so I, I think one of the reasons why we don't want to talk about the role of religion is that we have, as a nation, I think effectively, this is probably not the right word, but scapegoated individuals and you know, aspects of institutions without actually taking account, of, uh, taking account of the role of the citizenry in supporting this. And we don't want to face that conversation. I think that's part of it. And I think that's very true when you look at, you know, there are hard, there's hardly a family, I would say, um, uh, who was living in Ireland uh, 
uh, in the 1960s, 70s, and even into the 80s, who hasn't, you know, a, a family member or know somebody who was effectively incarcerated in a mother and baby home. There's hardly, you know, there's no small village in the country that hasn't kind of real personal knowledge of that. Because we're, you know, in, in, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, we were a country of 3.2 million people. So small, you know, the sort of outskirts of Manchester, effectively a city. That's the size of the country. So people don't want to face that, I think, as a kind of family level, kind of emotional, psychological level. I think that's very much part of it. Um, and the other bit, I think, is that, uh, so we've, we've decided we're leaving that all in the past and we're moving on. But we have no way of, uh, no, no um, commitment to talking about, well, okay, so now, so what is the role of religion now and what should what should the relationships be uh, and um i think that nobody wants to have that conversation and certainly nobody wants to you know to to lead the kind of the public conversation i i think there's you know people like the president who is able to get us to reckon with important ethical issues to do with our society is somebody who could, you know, somebody who could animate a conversation, uh, a national conversation about these issues. Um, but we, we really don't have that at the moment. And what we have is sort of amnesia, uh, scapegoating, uh, and scapegoating implies that there's no responsibility. So I don't want to say that, but I mean, but, you know, a uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, and um, let's just move on. But there, you know, every, as we know, every society has to reckon with its past and uh, in order to understand its present. And, and I think, you know, we will have to do that at some stage. I have a comment, but yeah, I think please. to add to your like wonderful presentation, I'm quoting a article from Paola Rivetti from the Feminist Review because this was mentioned briefly and also briefly in the article, but I think could be highlighted more. So the quote goes, looking at Irish history, the presence of a human surplus seems to cross the decades. By surplus, I refer to the materiality of the bodies that have been excluded or physically removed from official history and the public sphere, although they exist. They could not be absorbed in the official space of state institutions or spoken about in public discourse, and they were not welcomed among the, quote, purified Irish population. Sex workers, single mothers, women and girls that have been raped, lesbians, trans people, travelers, differently abled people and migrants. Such bodies are their surplus to the sanitized citizenry project in post-independence Ireland. And as such, they are not entitled to autonomy from the state. One of the ambitions of the referendum was to reverse this history. However, today's legal provision on abortion reveals the persistence of such a human surplus which was barely included in the referendum campaign and was excluded from the post-referendum regime of reproductive rights. Although the existence of abortion services represents a massive positive change, the exclusion of non-white, non-settled, non-abled and non-Irish bodies remains a constant. I just don't think it can be understated that often who is disproportionately affected by such restrictive reproductive laws, both here in Ireland, but also for example, the US where I grew up, are poor people and marginalized people, whether by race, gender identity, or abilities. So I just wanted to add that because I think even with this current referendum, the, the restrictions are predominantly gonna be felt by poor people and also marginalized. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's absolutely right. And that's where, you know, um, this issue of access where there are whole parts, actually there's sort of a spine and going down the middle of the country, we can, effectively see it when you map it to say that if you live, you know, in, in any of these areas, you will have to travel to 
you know, to Dublin or to Cork uh, to access a GP who will even, you know, have a conversation with you about access to, to abortion. So, and you're absolutely right. Um, this is, well, this is an issue for, for anybody who is pregnant and who, who wants a termination, but it disproportionately affects people who, you know, don't have private cars, you know, can't, you know, have, can't leave their other children for a, a day or two, you know, and, and similarly, that, I mean, that's, that's also, we, we saw over the years that that really disproportionately, the, the absence of um, access to termination in Ireland and, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the use of the UK was again, that was an, an issue um, uh, for, you know, anybody who couldn't access five or 600 euro to, 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 to travel and et cetera. So, um, you know, it, 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 Absolutely, we know that uh, in in all contexts, it's uh, the um, differently abled traveler women um, who don't um, speak the English easily and so need access to um, you know translators or friends who can you know support them. All of this in, impacts access. Um, Yeah, do we have any, I'm not sure if we have any questions online. So, um, anybody, any other questions uh, or comments? Or, yeah, sure. Yeah, please. Um, first, uh, I came here to uh, um, Dublin in, I think, 1988, and I spent a lot, was been back and forth a lot, and then in 1994, I came here to live, and uh, um, in sort of trying to absorb the mood in the country, uh, I noticed very rapid change in that time. And uh, one of the big things in 1994 was that there was a television series called Father Ted, in which three priests uh, on an island of the West Coast. Yeah, you're, you're laughing at it as, as I'm saying this because it was so funny. And uh, this series was hugely popular. And suddenly, and that was totally new, everybody, thought, hang on, we can laugh at the church. And through the, 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 the 1990s, uh, and then that continued, and then I was away for six years, and I came back to a country that had changed in further in those, those six years. Um, the mood here changed. Um, and I, I wonder, could you say something about how, how you perceive how the mood has changed uh, in relation to the church and how, how that has effect, affected these developments that you've been discussing? Yeah, thank you. I'll say something very brief about that because I know people need to go and get their coffee. Um, yeah, the, the mood has changed and it's part, so in a number of different ways. I mean, I think um, you, can see that there is a there is a uh, amongst a, a kind of cohort of the population there is what's happening in many countries European countries and now in North America as well sort of a gradual um, sort of uh, a, a larger group of people are saying I have no religion I'm agnostic I do and and even if I believe belong to a particular religious tradition, I'm making my own determinations about these critical issues to do with, you know, personal morality issues about um, sexuality, uh, reproduction, etc. 
Uh, I think within religious traditions, or certainly within Catholicism in Europe and North America, that's happening as well. You know, so, so many um, people who um, continue to be affiliated with the Roman Catholic Church disagree profoundly with the church on a whole series of issues, including, you know, same-sex marriage, um, reproduction, etc. So, and there's a, there, you know, there's a lot of theological debate about this sort of cleavage um, between the authoritative teaching and, you know, what people actually believe. So I think that, and I think um, those two things you saw very vividly in the Irish context in the in the 2018 referendum. We've talked a lot in Ireland about the first, which is, you know, the, the gradual secularization and pluralization of the country and the way in that which that has impacted uh, on these issues. But I think the far more profound change in Ireland is the 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 um, the, the numbers of Roman Catholics who say we believe these positions that the church holds are unethical. Um, you know, they do not represent our values. They are in, um, uh, they, they um, uh, conflict with the, you know, the essential values of Roman Catholicism or Christianity, which is about um, social justice, inclusion, human dignity, etc. So I think that that is, far more profound impact on this than, than, than most things. And I think you see that with the, you know, the 64% turnout uh, and the 67% um, acceptance. Um, and, you know, if you look at both the um, 2015 um, same-sex marriage um, referendum and also the, um, the this 2018 uh, uh, repeal uh, the Eighth uh, Amendment, so, so many of the stories and the narratives were, you know, um, uh, of people saying, I'm a Catholic, I'm a grandmother, my, you know, I, I believe in a woman's right to choose, I changed my mind, you know, so, so I do think that that, that, and, and that's about, um, the, the, that is linked to the decline in the social power of Catholicism as a social institution because people now feel that they can speak that distinction that, that they make between their belonging and what they, you know, and their values. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, such was the social control and the ex, um, expectation of conformity. Uh, that that was even if the, even if people believed that they didn't feel that they could say it. So I think that those are really profound changes in the Irish context, and uh, I, I think that that uh, does account for for a lot. Shall we go for coffee? Thank you very much. <laughs>